assalamu alaikum students welcome to cambridge igcse mathematics today's lecture is based on the solution of a past paper as you already know past papers are essential to prepare for any exam they help you fine tune your concepts they indicate how each topic is going to appear in the exam this is paper 4 of may june 2021 and the variant of the paper is 4 3 and here are some instructions to consider before solving the paper we have to answer all the questions on the question paper we have to answer all questions the use of calculator is allowed where necessary we can also use tracing paper we have to express the answers correct to three significant figures and in case of angles we have to express them correct to one decimal place and for pi we will either use our calculator or we can use the value 3.142 the total mark for this paper is 130 now let's begin with the solution and you can follow along to practice so we start off with the first question Yasmin and Zek share an amount of money in the ratio 21 is to 19. Yasmin receives six dollars more than Zek. Calculate the total amount of money shared by Yasmin and Zek. Okay, so here, let us suppose that the total amount of money that is shared between Yasmin and Zek is X dollars. Okay, so let the total amount be equal to x dollars the total amount is x dollars okay so this amount of money is shared in the ratio 21 is to 19 so what are the total parts in which the amount x is shared okay so to find the number of parts we take the sum of ratio so here sum of the ratio is 21 plus 19 which is equal to 40 so the total amount x is divided into 40 parts so out of which 21 parts belong to yasmin and 19 parts go to z okay so here yasmin receives 21 out of 40 of the total amount and z gets 19 out of 40 of the total amount <coughs> Okay, so as the total amount is x, so yes means share will become. So yes means share will be equal to twenty one over forty times x. Okay, so twenty one over forty of total. Here total is x, and of means multiplication. So twenty one by forty times x. So this will be yes means share, which can be written as. 21x over 40. Similarly, Zach's share will be equal to 19 over 40 times x, which becomes 19x over 40. Now here, Yasmin receives six dollars more than Zach. Okay, so this means that the difference between Yasmin's share and Zach's share is six dollars. Okay, so if we subtract Zach's share from Yasmin's share, we get six. So this means twenty-one x over forty minus nineteen x over forty is equal to six. So we can write the left hand side is twenty-one x minus nineteen x, which is two x over forty. Which is equal to six, 
and 2x is equal to 6 times 40. So, 2x is equal to 240. So, x becomes 240 divided by 2, so which is equal to 120. Hence, the total amount of money there is being shared between Yasmin and Zayek is $120. Okay, now the second part of the question. In a sale, all prices are reduced by 15%. Yasmin buys a blouse with an original price of $40. Calculate the sale price of the blouse. Okay, so here the original price is $40. But in a sale, Yasmin buys it at a price that is reduced by 15%. Okay, so here the sale price will be equal to 15% less than its original price, which is $40. Okay, so 15% less than $40. So now we will reduce $40 by 15%. Okay, so as you already know, so when we reduce a quantity by a given percentage, we subtract that percentage from 100. So now 100 minus 15 will be equal to 85%. Okay, so this means the sale price will be equal to 85% of $40. So now what will be 85% of $40? So this will be equal to 85 over 100 multiplied by 40. So which will give us, we move on to the calculator. So 85 over 100 multiplied by 40. So we get 34. So this is equal to 34. So the sale price is $34. Now Zeke buys a shirt with a sale price of $29.75. Calculate the original price of the shirt. So now here the sale price is $29.75 and we have to calculate the original price. Okay, so let the original price be equal to X dollars. So here let us suppose that original price is X dollars. Okay, so now here the sale price $29.75. So this is equal to 15% less than X. Okay. So, 29.75 will be equal to, so now what is 15% less than x? So, this will be equal to 85% of x, which is 85 over 100 times x. So, which is equal to 29.75 equal to 85x over 100. So, we will solve it for x. So, which is equal to 29.75 times 100 equal to 85x. Okay, so here we have multiplied both sides by 100 or we have shifted this 100 over to the left hand side. So this becomes 2975 equals 85x. So x will become 2975 over 85. And if we move on to the calculator, 2975 divided by 85. So we get 35. Okay. So here the original price will be $35. So now we move on to the part B of question number 
Xavier's salary increases by 2% each year. In 2010, his salary was $40,100. Calculate his salary in 2015. Give your answer correct to nearest dollar. Okay, so here the original salary that Xavier gets in 2010 is $40,100. So now we have to calculate his salary after five years. There is his salary in 2015. So as you already know, so when we increase a given quantity in a fixed proportion, in a fixed ratio, okay, so we will use the formula that we use for compound interest. So there is amount A will be equal to P times 1 plus R over 100 raised to the power T. Okay, so here A is the amount, final amount, P is the initial amount, we also call it principal and R is basically the rate or the percentage in which some quantity is increased and T is the time in years. So here to calculate Xavier's amount in 2015, so the amount A will be equal to 40,100 times 1 plus 2 over 100 to the power 5. Okay, so here the initial amount was 40,100 and the time T in years is 5 and the rate is 2 percent. Okay, so we can also write it as 40,100 into 1.02 to the power 5. Okay, so if we calculate it, so 40,100 times 1.02 to the power 5. So this is 44,273.64 dollars. So if we round it off to the nearest dollar, so we will get 44,274. Okay, so the amount in 2015 is $44,274. So $44,274 is the amount that Xavier gets in 2015. So now in the second part, in which year is Xavier's salary first greater than $47,500? So here we have to determine the year in which his salary exceeds 47,500. The year in which his salary gets greater than 47,500. So again we will use the same formula for the amount but here we will determine the time t in years that it takes Xavier's salary to become greater than $47,500. Okay, so we will write the same formula over here. So the principal amount or the initial amount was 40,100 times 1 plus R over 100 to the power T. So we will calculate T over here. So this amount is greater than $47,500. So we will solve this inequality for T. So we will see which value of t makes this inequality true. So as we have already seen in the previous part that when t is 5, his salary is 44,274. So we will try the values which are greater than 5. So again we will determine the value t with some trials. Okay? So if we put t equals 6 over here, so we get 40,100 into 1.02 to the power 6. So we get 45,159, so which is less than 47,500. So if we take t equals 7, so we get 46,062, which is again less than the value. So if we take 
8, we get 46,983, which is still less than our value. So let's take 9. So now we get the value 47,923, which is greater than 47,500. Okay, so here t equals 9 is a solution to this inequality. So after 9 years, starting from $40,100, Xavier salary becomes greater than $47,500. Okay, so, so now we have to calculate the year from 2010 in which his salary becomes greater than $47,500. Okay, so we have to calculate the year which is 9 years from 2010. So, so this becomes 2019. Okay, so the year is 2019. So in 2019, Xavier's salary is first greater than $47,500. So now we move on to the part C. In January 2020, the population of a town was 5% more than its population in January 2018. In January 2020, in 21, the population of this town was 2% less than its population in January 2020. Calculate the overall percentage increase in the population from January 2018 to January 2021. Okay, so here uh, the population starts from 2018. Okay, so let us suppose that the population of the town in 2018 is x okay so let the population so let the population in 2018 be equal to x so in january 2020 the population will be 5% more okay so the population population in 2020 will be equal to 5% more than x so 5% more than x so what is 5% more than x so we have to increase x by 5% so we will take 105% of x so 105% of x so which is equal to 105 over 100 times x or we can also write it as 105x over 100 okay so this is the population in 2020 so now the population in 2021 is 2% less than 2% less than its population in 2020 so which is 2% less than this value over here 105 x over 100 so now we have to decrease this quantity by 2% so we are going to take 98% so 98% of 105 x over 100 so which is equal to 98 over 100 times 105 x over 100 so which is equal to 98 times 105 over 100 times 100 so which is equal to 1.029x okay so this is the population in 2021 so now we have to calculate the overall percentage increase percentage increase from 2018 to 2021 
so we have to first find the difference in the population values of 2018 and 2021 so which will give us increase so increase is so is increase is 1.029x minus x okay the population in 2021 is 1.029x and in 2018 it was x so we will subtract them to calculate the increase so this becomes 0.029 x okay so this is the increase in population from january 2018 to january 2021 so now we are going to find the percentage increase so the percentage increase will be equal to the increase which is 0.029x so we will divide it by the original value of population in 2018 which is x so divided by x so multiplied by 100 so now we get 0.029 times 100 so which is equal to 2.9% hence the overall percentage increase in the population from january 2018 to january 2021 is 2.9% now we move on to the second question so question number 2 part a y equals px squared plus t find the value of y when p equals 3 x equals 2 and t is equal to negative 13 so here in this equation we have to find the value of y given the values of p x and t so we will replace p x and t with their respective values to get y equals 3 times 2 squared plus negative 13 okay so here p is 3 x is equal to 2 and t is equal to negative 13 so if we simplify it further so we get 12 minus 13 so which is equal to negative 1 so y is equal to negative 1 now the second part rearrange the formula to write x in terms of p t and y so here we have to solve this equation for x so we have to make x the subject of this equation so we can rewrite this equation so let us rewrite the equation y equals px squared plus t so we have to make x the subject of this equation so we can write y minus t is equal to px squared or y minus t over p is equal to x squared so now to get rid of square we take square root on both sides of the equation okay so by taking square root on both sides so we get y minus t over p square root is equal to x squared square root so now the square root of x square will be equal to x so we will get x equals plus minus y minus t over p square root because the square root of a quantity can be positive or negative so x is equal to plus or minus square root of y minus t over p so this is the value of x so here we have written x in terms of y t and p so this was the requirement of the question so now we move on to part b of question number 2 factorize 15x squared minus 2x minus 8 okay so this is a quadratic expression and we have to factorize it 
So, as you already know to factorize a quadratic expression we use the method of mid term breaking. Okay, so, here we will break down the middle term. So, for this first of all we will multiply 15 and negative 8. So, if we multiply 15 and negative 8, so we get minus 120. So, now we are going to look for two factors of minus 120 which give us minus 2 on adding or subtracting. So, now let us write all the factors of 120. So, we know that 2 times 60 is 120, 3 times 40 is 120, 4 times 30 is 120 and 6 times 20 is 120 and 8 times 15 is 120 and 10 times 12 is 120. So, here 10 and 12 which are factors of 120. So, they will give us 2 on subtracting. So, we will take 10 and 12. So, here the product is negative 120. So, one of the numbers will be negative and the other will be positive and we need negative 2. So, we will take the bigger number as negative and the smaller one is positive. So, we will take minus 12 and plus 10. So, these are the two numbers which on multiplying give us negative 120 and they provide negative 2 on adding them. So, here we can break the middle term. So, we will write the first term as it is. So, in the middle term we will write minus 12x plus 10x and the last term as it is. So, this is that we get after breaking the middle term. So, now we will collect the first two terms and third and four terms together. So, we will collect the terms and we will see what is common in the terms so that we can factor it out. So, in 15x squared and 12x the common factor is 3x. So, if we take 3x common from here we get 5x minus 4. Similarly, in the terms 10x and 8 if the common is 2. So, we will get 5x minus 4. So, from here we can write in factor form is 3x plus 2 times 5x minus 4. Okay, so, these are the factors of 15x squared minus 2x minus 8. Okay, so, the factorization of 15x squared minus 2x minus 8 is 3x plus 2 times 5x minus 4. So, now the second part solve the equation 15x squared minus 2x minus 8 is equal to 0. So, here we have to solve this equation. Now, the expression on the left hand side is the same that we have already factorized. So, we will replace the left hand side by its factors. So, we will use the factorized form of this expression. So, 3x plus 2 times 5x minus 4, so which is equal to 0. So, this implies either 3x plus 2 is equal to 0 or 5x minus 4 is equal to 0. So, if we solve the first equation for x we get x is equal to minus 2 over 3 and from here we get x is equal to 4 over 5. So, these are the solutions of this quadratic equation. So, x is equal to minus 2 over 3 or x is equal to 4 over 5. So, these are the solutions. Okay, now part C of the question x cubed minus 16x y squared. So, we have to factorize this expression completely. So, here we can see that x is a common factor in these two terms. So, taking x common or factoring x out from here. So, we get x squared minus 16 y squared. 
so which is equal to x times x squared minus 4y squared so we can write it like this so now we will use the identity a squared minus b squared equals a plus b times a minus b to factor this expression so we can write the whole expression as x times x plus 4y times x minus 4y okay so x plus 4y and x minus 4y are the factors of this expression so the complete factorization is x times x plus 4y times x minus 4y so now part d of the question simplify this expression so here to simplify this expression we will factorize both numerator and denominator so here we will collect the first two terms and the last two terms to factorize it okay so we can write the numerator in the form so 1 times 2x minus 1 so here we have taken one common from the first two terms and so the common factor in the third and fourth term is negative 2a so if we take negative 2a common from here so we get 2x negative 1 so divided by x times 2x minus 1 so we can factorize the denominator by taking x common from here to get x times 2x minus 1 so in factor form we can write this numerator over here is 1 minus 2a times 2x minus 1 so divided by x times 2x minus 1 so here we can see that numerator and denominator have a common factor which is 2x minus 1 so we can cancel it out to get 1 minus 2a over x so this is the simplified form of the expression so 1 minus 2a over x is the answer now this is question number three those test scores last term were 6 7 7 7 8 9 9 10 10 find the range the mode the median so here we are given a data which contains the numbers which are basically the test scores that zo got last term and for this data we have to find the range the mode and the median so let us first of all find the range of this data now the range of any data is basically the difference in its highest value and the smallest value so the range of this data is basically the highest value minus the smallest value the highest value minus the smallest value so here our highest value is 10 and the smallest value is 6 so the range will be 10 minus 6 which is equal to 4 so 4 is the range of this data now we have to find the mode the mode of a data is the most repeated value in the data so this is the most repeated value or the most frequent value in the data the most repeated value or the most frequent value in the data so what is the most repeated value or the most frequent value in this data so here as you can see that 7 is the most repeated value over here 7 is 
the most frequent value in this data okay so 7 is the mode of this data now the median the median of a data is basically a value which lies at the middle of the data to find the median the data has to be arranged from the lowest value to highest value and if the data is arranged the middle value of the data is the median so the median of a data splits the data into two equal halves so that 50% of the data lies before it and 50% lies after it so here our data is already arranged so what is the value that lies exactly at the middle of this data so from here we can see that 8 is the value which lies exactly at the middle so 4 values lie before it and 4 values lie after it so 8 is the median of this data so here the median is 8 ok now let's do part b of this question the cumulative frequency diagram shows information about the time taken by each of 200 students to solve a problem so here we are given a cumulative frequency diagram so from this cumulative frequency diagram we have to find an estimate of the median and the interquartile range so as we have already discussed the median is the middle value of a data it divides the data into two equal parts so to find the median from cumulative frequency diagram over here we take half of the highest value half of the total value so to find median so we take half of the total value or the highest value so here the highest value from the graph the highest value is 200 so half of 200 will give us 100 ok so 100 is the half of the total cumulative frequency so which is the value 100 which lies over here so now our median will be the value which corresponds to this cumulative frequency and it will lie on the x axis so it will be the value over here on the horizontal axis which corresponds to 100 from the graph so now the value corresponding to 100 from the graph will be this value on the x axis ok so this value on the x axis because it corresponds to 100 from the graph so this value 14 is going to be the median of the data ok so the median here is 14 14 minutes so 14 minutes is the median now we find the interquartile range so interquartile range is the difference in the upper quartile and lower quartile so the interquartile range of a data is equal to upper quartile minus lower quartile now the quartiles are basically quarters and upper quartile is taken to be third quarter or 3 by 4 of the total value and lower quartile is basically the first quarter or 1 by 4 of the total ok so upper quartile is 75 percent of the total and lower quartile is 25 percent of the total ok so first of all we find the upper quartile value and then the lower quartile value and then we subtract to find the interquartile range 
so to find the upper quartile from the graph we take 3 by 4 of the total value so upper quartile will correspond to 3 by 4 of the total value here so 3 by 4 of 200 because our total is 200 so 3 by 4 of 200 will give us 150 so 150 is the cumulative frequency which lies somewhere here so which lies between 140 and 160 okay so again this this is not our upper quartile this is just cumulative frequency so our upper quartile will be the value corresponding to this 150 from the graph and it will lie on the x axis so on the x axis this value is the value over here which is 15 okay so our so our upper quartile will be 15 so here the upper quartile which is also written as q3 so this is equal to 15 minutes and now the lower quartile is taken as 1 by 4 of the total value so 1 by 4 of the total value so 1 by 4 of 200 is 50 okay so the upper quartile will be the value corresponding to 50 from the graph on the x axis so this value is 11 so lower quartile is 11 so lower quartile so which is also represented as q1 so this is equal to 11 minutes okay so our upper quartile from the data from the graph is 15 minutes and the lower quartile is 11 minutes okay so the interquartile range which is upper quartile minus lower quartile or q3 minus q1 so this will be equal to 15 minus 11 so which is 4 minutes so 4 minutes is the interquartile range from this cumulative frequency diagram so now we come to part c of the question here we are given a table of values so these are the test scores of 200 students okay so here three students got a score of 5 10 students got a score of 6 and so on and we have to calculate the mean of this data so here we have a frequency table and we have to calculate the mean so here we will use the formula that the mean of a frequency table is calculated as sigma fx divided by sigma f or summation fx divided by summation f okay so here what we have to do is we have to multiply each frequency with its corresponding value and then we have to add them and then we have to divide them by the total frequency okay so so let us call these values as x values and these values as f values frequency values okay so here we have to multiply each f value with x value and then we have to add them and then we have to divide by the total frequency so the mean will be equal to so mean will be equal to so 3 times 5 plus 10 times 6 plus 43 times 7 plus 75 times 8 plus 48 times 9 plus 21 times 10 and then we have to divide this whole thing by the total frequency so the total will be 3 plus 10 plus 43 but we already know that the total number of students 
is 200 so this total will also be 200 so divided by 200 so this will give us the mean of this data 3 times 5 plus 10 times 6 plus 43 times 7 plus 75 times 8 plus 48 times 9 plus 21 times 10 divided by 200 so this is 8.09 so the mean is 8.09 so now let us do part d of the question the height in centimeter of each of 200 plants is measured the histogram shows the result okay so this is our histogram which shows frequency density on the vertical axis and the height in centimeter on the x-axis horizontal axis so calculate an estimate of the mean height so we have to calculate mean from this frequency density diagram or the histogram okay so here we are given the intervals from 50 to 80 the frequency density is 1 and from 80 to 100 the frequency density is 3.5 and from 100 to 110 the frequency density is 4 and so on okay so here we are given different intervals so from 50 to 80 we have one interval and the second interval is from 80 to 100 and the third interval is from 100 to 110 and then from 110 to 120 and then from 120 to 160 okay so here we are given five intervals and for these intervals we have to find the mean so to find the mean of an interval so we have to take the middle values of the intervals and we have to multiply each middle value with its corresponding frequency and then we have to add so here we will use the same formula for mean there is summation fx over summation f so here f will be the frequency and x will be the mid value of each interval or each class so for example the mid value of 50 to 80 this interval will be the mid the middle value is 65 okay so here from 80 to 100 the middle value is 90 so from here we can see the middle value is 90 similarly for 100 to 110 the middle value is 105 and the middle value of the interval from 110 to 120 is 115 and the middle value from 120 to 160 is 140 but now we need frequencies so first of all for each interval we have to calculate its frequency so now from frequency density how can we calculate frequency for this we use a formula so frequency density is equal to so frequency density is equal to frequency divided by class width divided by class width okay so to find the frequency of a class or an interval we will use this formula that frequency density is equal to frequency divided by class width so we, we can also write it as frequency is equal to frequency density multiplied by class width 
सो फ्रीक्वेंसी इज इक्वल टू फ्रीक्वेंसी डेंसिटी मल्टीप्लाइड बाई क्लास विथ ओके सो टू फाइंड द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ एनी इंटरवल ऑन द फ्रीक्वेंसी डायग्राम वी मल्टीप्लाई द फ्रीक्वेंसी डेंसिटी विद इट्स क्लास विथ सो हेयर इज द क्लास विथ एंड हेयर इज इट्स फ्रीक्वेंसी डेंसिटी वी कैन ऑल्सो से दैट वी हैव टू फाइंड द एरिया ऑफ दीज रेक्टेंगल सो टू सो इफ यू फाइंड द एरिया ऑफ दिस रेक्टेंगल सो यू विल गेट द फ्रीक्वेंसी और वी कैन मल्टीप्लाई द फ्रीक्वेंसी डेंसिटी बाय द क्लास विथ नाउ द फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ दिस फर्स्ट इंटरवल और क्लास विल बी इक्वल टू frequency density multiplied by class width so here frequency density is 1 so multiplied by width of the class from 50 to 80 is 30 so 1 times 30 is 30 so the frequency is 30 now for the second interval or rectangle so here the frequency will be equal to 3.5 times 20 so here the frequency density is 3.5 and the width of the class from 80 to 100 is 20 so 3.5 times 20 so frequency will be equal to 70 and for the third rectangle or interval from 100 to 110 so frequency will be equal to 4 times 10 so here frequency density is 4 and the width is 10 from 100 to 110 so this is 40 and for the fourth rectangle over here so frequency will be equal to 3.6 times 10 so here the frequency density is 3.6 and the width is 10 from 110 to 120 the width is 10 so so 3.6 times 10 is 36 so here the frequency is 36 and for the last rectangle or interval from 120 to 160 so frequency will be equal to 0.6 multiplied by 40 so here the frequency density is 0.6 and the width from 120 to 160 is 40 so frequency becomes 24 so now we have all the frequencies of all the intervals now we can easily calculate the mean so the mean now will be equal to so 30 times 65 so now we are multiplying each frequency with the middle value of the interval or the middle value of the class so we have already calculated the middle values over here so mean is equal to 30 times 65 plus 70 times 90 plus 40 times 105 plus 36 times 115 plus 24 times 140 this whole thing divided by the total so what was the total over here the total was 200 200 plants is the total of this data so 200 so if we calculate it so the mean will be equal to 99.75. So this is equal to 99.75. So 99.75 cm is the mean height of the plants. So now we move on to the next question which is question number 4. so this question is 
based on basically the topic which is coordinate geometry okay so this is coordinate geometry question so a is the point 1 comma 5 and b is the point 3 comma 9 m is the midpoint of ab okay so m is the midpoint of the line which which is connecting a and b find the coordinates of m so m is the midpoint of ab so to find m we will use the midpoint formula okay so as you already know that so if we have two points with coordinates x1 y1 x2 y2 then the midpoint is given by this formula so midpoint is equal to x1 plus x2 by 2 comma y1 plus y2 by 2 so we use this formula to calculate the midpoint so here the midpoint of the point A which is 1 5 and the point B which is 3 9 will be equal to so this is M so M will be equal to so 1 plus 3 by 2 so here we first add both x values and then divide by 2 and now we add both the y values and then divide by 2 so we get 4 by 2 comma 14 by 2 so which simplifies to 2 comma 7 so 2 comma 7 is the point M so 2 and 7 are the coordinates of M so now find the equation of the line that is perpendicular to AB and passes through M give your answer in the form y equals mx plus c now to, now we have to find the equation of a line which passes through this point 2 comma 7 and is perpendicular to AB so as you already know that in order to find the equation of a line we need two things the gradient of the line and the point okay so here the point is already given that it passes through the point M that we have already calculated which is 2 comma 7 now we have to find the gradient okay so as our line is perpendicular to the line AB okay so this means that its gradient will be the negative reciprocal of the gradient of AB because perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal gradients so first of all we find the gradient of AB and then we will take its negative reciprocal to find the required gradient okay so now the, what is the gradient of AB gradient or slope we also call it slope slope or gradient of AB so this is point A this is point B so what is the gradient of AB so what is the formula for gradient so the formula for gradient is if we have two points x1 y1 and x2 y2 then the gradient of the line that connects these two point is given by the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 so this is the gradient formula so from this formula from the points 1 5 and 3 9 we get the gradient is 9 minus 5 over 3 minus 1 so which is 4 over 2 so which is equal to 2 so the gradient of a b is 2 now the gradient of gradient of the line perpendicular to a b so now what will be the gradient of the line which is perpendicular to a b so this will be equal to the negative reciprocal of this gradient okay so we take the reciprocal of this okay so we take so we reverse it so we flip it and we also take the negative of it so minus 1 by 2 so this is the value of m for our required line now we know that the equation of a line is given by the formula y equals mx plus c okay so where m is its gradient so our gradient is minus 1 by 2 so the line will be equal to y equals minus 1 by 2x plus c so in order to find c we will substitute 
the point that the line passes through so our point is 2 comma 7 so x is 2 y is 7 so here we replace y with 7 and x with 2 to find c so 7 is equal to minus half times 2 is minus 1 plus c so c will be equal to 7 plus 1 c is equal to 8 so c is 8 so if we plug in the value of c over here so we get y equals minus 1 by 2x plus 8 so the equation of the required line is y equals minus 1 by 2x plus 8 now let us do part b of this question the position vector of p is minus 2 3 and the position vector of q is minus 2 5 find the vector pq so here we have been given the position vector of two points p and q the position vector of p is minus 2 3 and the position vector of point q is minus 2 5 and we have to write the vector pq now p is the starting point or the initial point of the vector and q is its final point or the terminal point so in order to express a vector in terms of the position vectors of its initial point and final point so what we do is so we take the position vector of its end point minus the position vector of its initial point so vector pq will be equal to position vector of q which is the end point minus position vector of p which is the initial point okay so the position vector of end minus the position vector of start so the position vector of q is minus 2 5 now minus the position vector of p is minus 2 3 so if we subtract so we get minus 2 plus 2 and 5 minus 3 so we get 0 2 okay so 0 2 is the vector pq now the second part r is the point such that p r vector is equal to 3 times p q vector find the position vector of r ok so here p q is the same vector that we calculated in the first part now we have to find the position vector of r so now we will suppose that the position vector of r so position vector of r is x y so let us suppose that position vector of r is the vector x y so now we are given that p r vector is equal to 3 times p q vector so what is p r so the vector p r can be written as position vector of r minus position vector of p so which is equal to 3 times pq vector so pq vector is already found which is 0 2 so 3 times 0 2 now position vector of r so which is unknown so this is x y vector minus position vector of p what is the position vector of p so position vector of p is already known which is minus 2 comma 3 minus 2 3 so this is equal to now 3 times 0 2 will be 0 6 so we multiply 3 with 0 and then with 2 so x y will be equal to 0 6 plus minus 2 3 okay so here we have shifted this vector on the left hand side to the right so x y will be equal to 
zero minus two six plus three, so which is equal to minus two nine. So this is the position vector of point R. So this is minus two nine. Now, part C of the question. So here we have been given a triangle. So here our OT vector is equal to T, OU vector is equal to U, and UY is equal to two times of YT. Okay. So here the length UY is double the length of YT. Okay. So if YT is Suppose if this length is one, then this is twice of that, so this becomes two. Okay, so here we have divided the whole length u t into three parts. Two are over here, and one is over here. So it is divided into three parts. So u y will be equal to two third of u t, and y t will be equal to one third of total. So find O Y in terms of T and U. So we have to find the vector O Y. So O to Y. So let's solve this. So now we can write the vector O Y as O U plus U Y. Okay, so O Y, so from O to Y is the same as from O to U, then U to Y. So we will find the vector O Y from here. So we already know the vector O U, which is equal to U, but first we have to determine the vector U to Y, U Y vector, and we know that here U Y vector. Is basically equal to two by three of the vector u t. Okay, so here u to y is equal to two by three because the whole the the whole length from u to t is divided into three parts, and u y is two parts of it. Okay, so u y is equal to two out of three parts of u t. So first of all, we have to determine u t. So we can easily determine u t. So u t from u to t is equal to. So we use the formula that from u to t. So u t will be equal to. So position vector of t minus position vector of u. So here I am writing in short. PV for position vector, but you have to write it in full form position vector. So position vector of t. So what is position vector of t here? So this is small t, small t or t vector. So minus position vector of u is u. So t minus u. Okay. So u y will be equal to so two by three of t minus u. Okay, u t is t minus u. So we are putting this value of u t into this equation over here. So we get u y is equal to two by three of t minus u. So let us call this equation number two, and this be the equation one. So now we will put equation two into our equation one. To find O Y, so O Y is equal to O U, which is U, plus U Y, which is two by three of T minus U, and we have to write this in simplest form. So we can write it as. So the denominator over here is. is Is one, so we can write it as three u plus two times t minus u whole divided by three. So here we have made the denominator same, 
by multiplying the first fraction by 3 both in numerator and denominator or by taking the LCM. So 3u plus 2 times t minus u over 3 so which is equal to 3u plus 2t minus 2u over 3 so which is equal to 3u minus 2u is u so u plus 2t over 3. So the vector O y is equal to u plus 2t over 3. So you can also write it as 1 by 3 of u plus 2t. Now the second part says z is on OT and yz is parallel to uo. So it says that so z is a point on OT side that yz is so here yz is parallel to OU. So what is the vector OZ? So OZ is a vector which is parallel to T. So we know that so when two vectors are parallel so one vector will be equal to just a multiple of the other vector. So OZ will be equal to simply a multiple of T. So it will be equal to 2 times T or 1.5 times t or any multiple of t. Okay, so O to z, so if we divide it into roughly 3 equal parts, then O to z is 2 out of those 3 parts. So O z is simply 2 by 3 of t. So O z is 2 by 3 of t, the vector t. Now question number 5, solve the simultaneous equations x plus 2 y is equal to 13 and x plus 5 y is equal to 22. So here we can see that both the x terms are same in both the equations. So we can easily solve these two equations simultaneously by elimination. So if we subtract the second equation from the first equation, so we get the value of y and by putting the value of y back into any of the equation we get x. So, okay, so let us call this equation as equation 1 and this equation as equation 2. So now sub, subtracting, subtracting equation 2 from the equation 1. Okay, so if we subtract them, so we will basically change the sign of the sign of each term of the second equation. So this will be so this will be negative from positive. So this will be negative and this will also be negative. So now x minus x okay they get cancelled and 2y minus 5y so it will give us minus 3y so which is equal to 13 minus 22 so it will give us minus 9. So y will be equal to minus 9 divided by minus 3 so which is equal to 3. So y is equal to 3. So now we can put this value of y back into any of the two equations to get x. So let us put it in the first equation. So put in 1. So x plus 2 times y. So we replace y with 3 which is equal to 13. So x plus 6 is equal to 13. Okay, so x is equal to 13 minus 6. So x is equal to 7. So x is 7 and y is 3. So this is the solution of these two simultaneous equations. Now we have to solve the simultaneous equations given in part B. But here the first equation is a linear equation and the second equation is a quadratic equation. So we will solve this system of linear equations by substitution. Okay? So we solve them by the method of substitution. So how can we solve them by substitution? 
so let us call this first equation as equation 1 and this is equation 2 so we will substitute the value of y from the first equation into the value of y in the second equation so putting the value of y from equation 1 into equation 2 so the equation 2 will become 2 minus x is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 2 so here we get an equation which is in the variable x so now it will be a quadratic equation so we can also write it as x squared plus 2x plus 2 is equal to 2 minus x we move all the terms to the left so that we get 0 on the right hand side so x squared plus 2x plus 2 minus 2 plus x is equal to 0 okay so 2 on the left will be minus 2 and minus x on the left it will be plus x so x squared if we rearrange the terms so x squared plus 2x plus x plus 2 minus 2 is equal to 0 so we get x squared plus 3x is equal to 0 so plus 2 minus 2 is 0 2x plus x is 3x so this is the equation that we get from here so this equation can be easily solved by factorizing so if we take x common from here so we get x plus 3 is equal to 0 so this implies x is equal to 0 or x plus 3 is equal to 0 so x is equal to 0 or from here x is equal to minus 3 okay so here we get two values of x so what is y so we can substitute these values back into any of the equation but we will put them in the first equation y equals 2 minus x so y is equal to 2 minus x so x is 0 so y is equal to 2 similarly when x is 3 so y equals 2 minus x so 2 minus minus 3 so y will be equal to 2 plus 3 which is equal to 5 okay so when x is 0 y is 2 so when x is 0 y is 2 and when x is negative 3 so y is 5 so these are the solutions of these simultaneous equations now question 6 of the paper in a class of 24 students 18 students like homework h 15 students like tests t and one student does not like homework and does not like tests complete the venn diagram to show this information okay so this question is about venn diagram so we have to fill in the numbers on the diagram so after completing this we have to answer the remaining parts so part b write down the number of students who like both homework and tests and so on so first of all we have to complete the venn diagram to show this information okay so in the beginning we do not know the number of students who like both homework and tests so let us call the number of students who like both as x okay so there are 18 students who like homework so we have already taken x of them so the remaining will be 18 minus x and similarly there are total 15 students who like tests and we have taken x already out of them so the remaining number of students who like tests will be 15 minus x okay and we know that the grand total of the students is 24 okay so here 18 minus x plus x plus 15 minus x plus 1 so this total is equal to 24 so this will be equal to 18 plus 15 minus x plus 1 is equal to 24 so here minus x plus x they are cancelled so we simplify it further so we get 33 minus x plus 1 is equal to 24 so 33 plus 1 
minus 24 is equal to x. We have taken x on the right hand side. So we get 33 plus 134 minus 24 is equal to x. So x is 10. Okay, so there are 10 students who like both homework and tests. Okay, so here, so x is so 10, so 10 students like both. Okay, so this is 18 minus x, so 18 minus 10 is 8, and 15 minus x is 5. 15 minus 10 is 5. So 5, 10, and 8. So write down the number of students who like both homework and tests. So there are 10 students who like both homework and tests. Now find the number of elements in H prime intersection T. So we have to find the number of elements in this set H prime intersection T. So what is H prime? So H prime is, so H prime means, so H prime is equal to not of h. So, everything which is not h. Intersection t means together with t. Okay. So, now we have to find the number of students who like tests but not homework. Okay. So, here h prime intersection t. So, this shows not of h together with t not of h together with t. So here we have to find the number of students who don't like homework but they like tests. Okay, so this is the number of students who like tests but not homework. So not of H together with T. So this becomes, so from the diagram we can see that there are only five students who like tests but not homework. So this is five. So five students like tests but not homework. So a student is picked at random from the class. Write down the probability that this student likes tests but does not like homework. So here we have to write the probability. So we are picking a student at random from the class from, from 24 students. Okay. And we have to write the probability that this student likes the test but does not like homework. So now we know that there are five students who like test but does not homework. So the probability will be 5 divided by 24. So 5 out of 24 students like test but don't like homework. Now the part E of the question is two students are packed at random from the class. Now again we are considering all 24 students. Find the probability that both students do not like homework and do not like tests. There are no two students who don't like homework and don't like tests. So the number of students is 0. So 0 over 24. So the answer is 0. So this probability is 0. So two of the students who like homework are picked at random. Now we are considering the students who like homework. So how many students are there who like homework? So there are 18 students who like homework. Okay. So out of 18, we are going to pick the students, two students who also like tests. So out of these 18, we have to take two students who also like tests. So there are 10 students who like both homework and tests. Okay. So, 
so when we are going to take the first student we have 10 out of 18 options okay so we have 10 students to choose from 18 so the probability of first student to be chosen is 10 by 18 so after we have chosen one student so the probability of the second student will be 9 by 17 okay so if we simplify it so we get so 10 times 9 divided by 18 times 17 so we get 5 by 17 so the probability is 5 by 17 now question 7 part a write down the inequality in x shown by the number line okay so this number line shows all the numbers that are between minus 2 and 1 but here 1 is included and minus 2 is not okay so the number line shows all the numbers which are greater than strictly greater than minus 2 and less than or equal to 1 okay so here the numbers x so here for the numbers x x is strictly greater than minus 2 and x is less than or equal to 1 okay so if we combine them we can also write them in the form of a single inequality as negative 2 is less than x and x is less than or equal to 1 okay so here x shows all the numbers which are greater than minus 2 and less than or equal to 1 so x shows all the numbers which are between minus 2 and 1 including 1 but excluding minus 2 so now in part b write x squared plus 4x plus 1 in the form x plus p whole square plus q okay so we have to write this quadratic expression in this form and this form is called competing square form okay so we have to express the given quadratic expression in competing square form so to express this quadratic expression in this competing square form so we will take it equal to that completing square form and then solve for p and q okay so by setting these two expressions equal we will solve for p and q so the left hand side will be written as it is so we will expand right hand side and then we will compare the coefficients of like terms on both sides to find the unknowns p and q so let's expand x plus p whole squared so this will be equal to x squared plus 2px plus p squared so here we have used the identity that a plus b whole squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared so plus q as it is so x squared plus 4x plus 1 is equal to so x squared plus 2px plus p squared plus q okay so here we get two expressions that are equal so now for these two expressions to be equal the coefficients of like terms will also be equal so by comparing the coefficients of like terms on both sides So coefficients of like terms on both sides so we get 4 must be equal to so here 4 must be equal to 2p so 2p is equal to 4 so which gives us p equals 2 And similarly, 
1 must be equal to so here 1 must be equal to this constant term over here which is p square plus q so p square plus q is equal to 1 so replace p with its already calculated value which is 2 so 2 squared plus q is equal to 1 so 4 plus q is equal to 1 so q will be equal to 1 minus 4 which is minus 3 so q is minus 3 so after calculating p and q we will put them into this completing square form x plus p whole square plus q okay so the completing square form will become x plus 2 whole squared minus 3 okay so hence x squared plus 4x plus 1 will be equal to x plus 2 whole squared minus 3 so this was part 1 now second part of this question use your answer to part b1 to solve this equation because now we have to solve this equation so we will use the completing square form that we have already calculated in the first part so we will replace the left hand side with its completing square form which is x plus 2 whole squared minus 3 so this is equal to 0 so now we will solve this equation so x plus 2 whole squared is equal to 0 plus 3 so we have taken minus 3 to the right so x plus 2 whole squared is equal to 3 okay so if we take square root on both sides so we will get x plus 2 is equal to plus or minus square root of 3 okay so from here we will get x plus 2 is equal to positive square root 3 or x plus 2 is equal to negative square root 3 so this will give us x is equal to square root of 3 minus 2 or x is equal to negative square root of 3 minus 2 okay so if we take these values in decimal form so we will get So here we will get minus 0 0.268 so we have written this correct to three significant figures and here we will get x is equal to minus 3.73 so x is equal to either 0 0.268 or x is equal to minus 3.73 now this is the third part of the question use your answer to part b1 to write down the coordinates of the minimum point on the graph of this so as in part b1 we have written x squared plus 4x plus 1 is equal to so we have written it in completing square form as x plus 2 whole squared minus 3 so this is x plus 2 whole squared minus 3 now a quadratic expression which is given in completing square form has a minimum value where the term inside this bracket or the square term here is 0 so if we set x plus 2 equal to 0 so we get x is equal to minus 2 okay so at x is equal to minus 2 this expression will have a minimum value which is minus 3 so what will be the minimum point then so here x is equal to minus 2 and x coordinate is minus 2 and the y coordinate will be minus 3 so minus 2 comma minus 3 on the diagram sketch the graph of this quadratic expression okay so here we have been given the diagram okay, so now we are going to sketch the graph of this equation y equals x squared plus 4x plus 1 so here our x squared term is positive so we already know that the graph of a quadratic expression is a graph which is either this graph which opens upward or this graph which opens downward so this is a parabola 
upward opening parabola or a downward opening parabola. So here our x square term is positive. So the graph will be an upward opening parabola. Okay, so as we have already solved the equation x squared plus 4x plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay, and the solution of the equation x squared plus 4x plus 1 is equal to 0 were x equals minus 3.73 and x is equal to minus 0 0.268. So the solution of the equation x squared plus 4x plus 1 is equal to 0 were these two values and these are the values where the graph of this equation will cross the x-axis okay so it will cross the x-axis at these two values so let us plot these two values so this is minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and this is minus 4 so minus 3.73 is somewhere over here and minus 0 0.268 is somewhere here okay and here the constant term is 1 so this is the value where the graph crosses the y-axis so this is the y-intercept so here y-intercept or the value where the graph will cross the y-axis is 1 okay so this is 1 so this is 1 so the graph will cross the y-axis over here x axis over here and here and also the minimum value that we've already calculated was minus 3 so 1 2 3 so this is minus 3 so the minimum value is minus 3 and it always lies between these two values okay so the graph will be over here if we connect all these points so our graph will be from here to here this minimum point and from here to from here to here so this will be the minimum value minimum point so this is the sketch of the graph of y equals x squared plus 4x plus 1 now we are going to solve question number 8 a solid cuboid measures 20 centimeter by 12 centimeter by 5 centimeter calculate the volume of the cuboid so the volume of a cuboid the volume v of a cuboid is given by the formula length times width times height so using this formula so the volume of the given cuboid will be equal to so 20 cm times 15 cm times 5 cm so which becomes 1200 cubic centimeter so the volume of the cuboid is 1200 cubic centimeter calculate the total surface area of the cuboid now the surface area of a cuboid is given by the formula surface area is equal to so 2 times length into width plus width times height plus length times height so if you plug in the values over here so 2 times twenty times twelve plus twelve times five plus 20 times 5 so which is equal to 2 times 240 plus 60 plus 100 so which is equal to 2 times 400 so which is equal to 800 square centimeters so the surface area is 800 square centimeters now the part b is the surface area of the cuboid is painted the cost of the paint used is 1.52 dollars find the cost to paint one square centimeter of the cuboid give your answer in cents here we are given 
the cost of painting 800 square centimeter surface area and this cost is 1.52 dollars and we have to calculate the cost to paint 1 square centimeter of the cuboid here the cost of 800 square centimeter is equal to 1.52 dollars so we have to find the cost of 1 square centimeter so the cost of 1 square centimeter will be equal to 1.52 divided by 800 so which is equal to 0 0.0019 dollars so as we have to express the answer in cents so we will multiply it by 100 so this will be equal to 0 0.19 cents so 0 0.19 cents is the cost to paint one square centimeter of the cuboid okay now a solid metal cylinder with radius x and height 9x by 2 is melted all the metal is used to make a sphere with radius r find r in terms of x okay so here a solid metal cylinder with radius x is going to be melted into a sphere of radius r so this means that the volume of the cylinder will be equal to the volume of the sphere so to solve this we use the fact that volume of the volume of the cylinder is equal to the volume of the sphere now the volume of the cylinder is given by the formula pi r square h so pi into radius square so here radius is x so this will be pi times x square into height and height is 9x by 2 so this is equal to the volume of the sphere and the volume of sphere is given by this formula 4 by 3 pi r cube so here the radius is r so now from here we have to find r in terms of x so we can simplify this equation as 9 x cubed over 2 is equal to 4 by 3 r cube okay so here we have cancelled pi on both sides and x squared times x is x cubed so 9 x cubed over 2 is equal to 4 by 3 r cube so now if we have to find r in terms of x okay so if we cross multiply these two equations so we get 2 times 4 r cube which is 8 r cube so this is equal to 27 x cubed and r cubed is equal to 27 x cubed over 8 so to find r we will take cube root on both sides so the cube root of r cube is r so r is equal to in the cube root of 27x cube by 8 3x by 2 okay so the cube root of 27 is 3 the cube root of x cube is x and the cube root of 8 is 2 so r is equal to 3x by 2 so this is r in terms of x now we come to the part c which says that the diagram shows a cylinder of length 150 centimeter on horizontal ground the cylinder has radius 20 centimeter the cylinder contains water to a depth of 5 centimeter as shown in the diagram so calculate the volume of the water in the cylinder give your answers in liters okay so here we have to find the volume of this water over here which is inside the cylinder so if we see carefully the shape that this water is making inside this cylinder is basically a prism 
okay so we have to find the volume of this prism so now the volume of a prism is given by the formula so volume of a prism is equal to the area of cross section the area of cross section multiplied by the length or height of the prism okay so here the length of this prism is 150 cm and its cross section is basically this shape that i am sharing right now so this shape is the cross section of our prism so first of all we have to find this area that i have marked green over here and then we will multiply it by 150 to find the volume of water so let us first of all find this green area over here so let me draw it separately in a separate diagram so that we can easily understand how we are going to find this area so this is our figure and this is basically a sector of this circle over here so, okay so this is a sector and we are going to find the area of this sector first and then we will subtract the area of triangle from the sector so to find this circular area so in order to find the area of this sector so first of all we are going to need this angle so let us call this angle as theta so we are going to find this angle first so now the side the sides of this upper triangle are 20 cm each 20 cm 20 cm because they are the radius of the because they are the radii of the same circle over here so now let us drop a line which is perpendicular over here so now we are going to form two same right triangles so we are going to split this whole triangle into two equal two same right triangles now we already know that this length is 5 cm so this length is 5 cm and the total length from top to bottom the total length from here to here so this total length is equal to 20 cm because this is also a radius of this sector okay so this length is 5 and the total is 20 so this red length over here will be 15 cm so this is 15 cm now to find this whole angle first we find the angle of this triangle this right triangle so let us draw this triangle separately so we have to find this angle let's call it x and this length is 20 and this length is 15 so this is a right triangle so we can use the cosine of this angle to find the angle so here from this right angle triangle cos of x will be equal to 15 by 20 so the angle x will be equal to cos inverse of 15 by 20 so which is equal to 41.4 degree so now the angle of the sector is two times this angle because these two angles are exactly the same angles because these two right triangles are the same right triangles okay so this is again the same angle 41.4 so this total angle will be equal to 
twice of this angle. So the angle of the sector, so the angle theta of the sector is equal to 2 times 41.4, so which is equal to 82.8 degree. So now we can easily calculate the area of this whole figure, the area of this sector. So the area of the sector is given by the formula theta over 360 times pi r square. So here the angle theta is 82.8. So divided by 360 times pi into 20 square. Here the radius of the sector is 20. So if we calculate it, so we get 289 square centimeter. So the area of the sector is 289 square centimeter. Now we are going to find the area of this triangle. So the area of triangle which is on top of this circular region. So the area of so the area of this triangle over here is equal to half a b sin theta. So here we use this formula of the area of a triangle half a b sin theta. So which is equal to half into 20 times 20 times sin of 82.8. Okay. So here the sides of this triangle are 20 centimeter in 20 centimeter and the angle of this triangle is 82.8. So if we calculate this So this area is 198 square centimeter. So the area of the cross section which is this area. So this area is equal to the area of sector minus the area of the triangle. Now the area of cross section of the prism. is equal to the area of sector minus the area of triangle so which is 289 minus 198 so which is equal to 91 square centimeter so the cross sectional area of the prism is 91 and its length is 150 so the volume of water which is the volume of prism is equal to the cross sectional area 91 multiplied by the length of the prism. So the length of the prism is 150. So 91 times 150. So the answer is 13,650 cubic centimeter. So this is the volume of water in cubic centimeter, but we have to express it in liters. So we will divide it by 1000. So we will get 13.65 liters. So 13.65 liters is the volume of the water. Now we come to question number 9. So here we have been given a quadrilateral A, B, C, D and we have to calculate the perimeter of the quadrilateral. So we have to calculate the perimeter. So to find perimeter, first of all we need all its boundary lengths A, B, B, C, C, D and D, A then we have to add them. So let us first of all find the, a, the sides BC and CD of this upper triangle over here. So we already know 
one side and two angles of this triangle. So we can easily use sine rule to find the sides BC and CD. So from this triangle, triangle BCD, first of all, let us calculate this angle, the angle C. So this can be easily calculated by subtracting the sum of these two angles from 180. So here the angle C will be equal to 180 minus the sum of the angles 60 and 45. So this is equal to 180 minus 105. So which is equal to 75 degree. So now we can easily find the sides BC and CD from this triangle BCD using the sine rule. So from sine rule on the triangle BCD, the side BC divided by the sine of its opposite angle. So it will be sine of 60. So will be equal to the side 14 centimeter divided by the sine of its opposite angle which is 75. So from here we can calculate BC. So BC will be equal to 14 over sine of 75 multiplied by sine of 60. So if we calculate this, so this is 12.6 centimeter. Similarly, we can calculate the side DC. So here DC divided by sine 45 will be equal to 14 divided by sine 75. So DC by sine 45. So from the same triangle using the sine rule. So DC divided by sine of so DC divided by sine of 45 is equal to 14 divided by sine of 75. So DC will be equal to 14 over sine of 75 multiplied by sine 45. So this is equal to 35. So from the triangle ABD, so from the triangle ABD, cos of the angle 35 is equal to, so cos of 35 is equal to AB over 14. So AB over 14 and sine of 35 is equal to so sin 35 is equal to ad over 14 okay so ab will be equal to 14 times cos 35 and ad will be equal to 14 times sin 35 so ab is equal to Eleven point five centimeter and AD is equal to eight point zero three centimeter. Okay, so now we have determined all the boundary lengths of this quadrilateral ABCD. So now we will 
add the lengths of all of these boundary lengths of the quadrilateral to find its perimeter. So the perimeter of the quadrilateral ABCD will be so the perimeter of the quadrilateral ABCD is equal to AB length plus BC length plus CD length plus DA length. So AB length is 11.5 centimeter. BC is we have already calculated BC which is 12.6 and CD is 10.3 and DA or AD is 8.03. By adding all of this, we get forty two point four three centimeter. So, correct to three significant figures, the answer will be forty two point four centimeter. So 42.4 centimeter is the perimeter of this quadrilateral ABCD. So now we move on to the second part, part B of this question, question number 9. The diagram shows a cube. The length of the diagonal AB is 8.5. Calculate the length of an edge of the cube. So here we have to calculate any length of the edge. So here the edge of the cube is suppose x. Now each edge of the cube has the same length x. So we are going to find this unknown length. So here AB is equal to 8.5 centimeter. So the length AB is 8.5 centimeter. So first of all, let us find this length. And this is a right angle over here. So we are going to find this length from this right triangle. So from Pythagoras theorem. So let us call this length as AC. So AC is equal to x squared plus x squared whole square root so which is 2x squared square root so which is equal to square root of 2 times x so now we are going to use Pythagoras theorem again now on the triangle ACB so this is again a right angle so now on the triangle ACB so from Pythagoras theorem we get 8.5 square is equal to square root of 2x whole squared plus x squared. Okay, so 8.5 squared is equal to this length squared plus x squared. So 8.5 squared is equal to 2x squared plus x squared. So 8.5 square is equal to 3x square. So x square will be equal to 8.5 square over 3. And by taking the square root, so we get x equals 8.5 square over 3 whole square root. So which gives us x is equal to 4.91 centimeter. So now we have to calculate the angle between AB and the base of the cube. So now we have to calculate this angle theta. So this angle theta. So we have to calculate the angle which is from this AB to AC. So now as ACB is a right angle triangle. So as ACB is a right angle triangle and we already know the opposite side of the angle and 
the hypotenuse of this triangle so we can calculate this angle by taking the sine of the angle so sine theta is equal to x by 8.5 so sine theta is equal to so from the triangle acb sine theta is equal to 4.91 divided by 8.5 so theta is equal to sine inverse of 4.91 over 8.5 so which gives us so which gives us 35.28 so correct to one decimal place because the angles are given correct to one decimal place so this is equal to 35.3 degree so the angle is 35.3 degree now the question number 10 of the paper here so here we are given different functions f of x g of x h of x and j of x we are given four functions and we have to find first of all f of 2 so f of 2 means that we have to evaluate the function f at x is equal to 2 so we have to replace the value x by 2 in this function so f of 2 will be equal to 3 times 2 minus 2 okay so simply we have to replace the variable x in this function with 2 so we get 6 minus 2 which is equal to 4 so f of 2 is 4 so now second part g of 2 now we have to evaluate this function g at x equals 2 so we have to replace x over here with 2 so we get 5 times 2 minus 7 so which is equal to 10 minus 7 which is 3 so g of 2 is 3 now g f of 2 so this can be written as g of f of 2 okay g of f of 2 so we already know the value of f of 2 which is 4 so this can be written as g of 4 so now what is g of 4 so now we have to put 4 into the function g so in place of x over here we have to plug in 4 so we get 5 times 4 minus 7 so this is equal to 20 minus 7 which is 13 so g f of 2 is 13 now we have to find the inverse of the function f so our function f of x is 3x minus 2 so to find the inverse of a function we do it step by step so first of all we replace f of x with y so y equals 3x minus 2 so we get an equation in x and y then we have to solve this equation for x so so this becomes y plus 2 equals 3x so x is equal to y plus 2 by 3 okay so after doing this now we have to swap the positions of x and y so we will write y equals x plus 2 by 3 so now this y this function x plus 2 by 3 is the inverse of the function so f inverse of x is equal to x plus 2 by 3 find h f of x given your answer in the form ax squared plus bx plus c so now we have to find h f of x so this means we have to calculate h of f of x so this means that we are going to put the function f into the function h 
so we are going to put the function f into h so we have to put this function f into this function h in place of x so here in place of x we are going to write this whole value which is f of x so h of x is equal to x square plus x so this will be equal to 3x minus 2 squared plus 3x minus 2 okay since h of x is equal to x squared plus x okay so if we put the value 3x minus 2 over here so we get 3x minus 2 whole squared plus 3x minus 2 so now let us expand this square so this is 3x whole squared minus 2 into 3x into 2 plus 2 squared plus 3x minus 2 so which is equal to 9x squared minus 12x plus 4 plus 3x minus 2 so if we simplify it further so 9x squared minus 9x plus 2 so this is our required form so 9x squared minus 9x plus 2 so this is h of f of x or h f of x now find the derivative of h of x so again let us rewrite h of x h of x is equal to x squared plus x okay so this is h of x so the derivative is denoted by h prime of x so we will use the power rule of derivative so the derivative of x square is 2 times x plus the derivative of x is 1 so the derivative of h of x is 2x plus 1 so now find x when j inverse of x is equal to 4 so from here we have to find x but we don't need to find the inverse of j over here we can simply write this is x equals j of 4 so x equals j of 4 so now x equals j of 4 so what is j of 4 so we will replace the value of x in j function with 4 so what is j of 4 so the function j of x is 3 to the power x so j of 4 will be equal to 3 to the power 4 so j of x is equal to 3 to the power 4 so which is equal to 81 so x is equal to 81 now simplify j inverse of j of x so keep in mind that so when we apply inverse function of a function on the same function so both of them get cancelled out and we get only x so j inverse of j of x will be equal to x because here the functions j inverse and j they will cancel out each other so we will get x so for any function so f of f inverse of x is x similarly f inverse of f of x so this is also x okay so when two inverse functions apply together they cancel out each other's effect so j inverse of j of x is simply x now we come to the last question of the paper question number 11 these are the first four terms of a sequence so we are given first four terms of a sequence write down the next term so in order to write the next terms we have to basically identify the rule that is applied in the sequence so 11 7 3 minus 1 so here we can see that we are subtracting 4 so we are subtracting 4 from a term to get the next term so what will be the next term so we will subtract minus 4 from minus 1 so we get minus 5 so the next term is minus 5 so our next term is minus 5 write down 
the term to term rule for this sequence so the term to term rule for this sequence is subtract 4 or we can also write this as add negative 4 so this is the term to term rule for this sequence find the nth term of this sequence so this sequence has a constant difference of negative 4 okay the difference between these two terms is negative 4 similarly the difference between these two terms is negative 4 and so on okay so the nth term will be so nth term will be equal to minus 4 n plus 15 okay so minus 4 times n plus 15 so how did I write this so the constant difference is minus 4 so minus 4 times n so we always multiply n with this constant difference and then we see what to add or subtract here to get the first term now what to add in minus 4 to get 11 so if we add 15 to minus 4 we get 11 so the nth term will be minus 4 n plus 15 so we can also write this as 15 minus 4 n okay so this is the nth term now the part b of question is the nth term of a different sequence is 2 n over n plus 1 find the difference between the fifth term and the sixth term okay so here we already know the nth term so first of all we are going to find the terms fifth term and the sixth term and then we have to take the difference okay so here nth term is equal to 2n over n plus 1 so what will be the fifth term here so fifth term is we will simply replace n with 5 so 2 times 5 over 5 plus 1 so the fifth term is 10 by 6 and now sixth term is simply 2 times 6 divided by 6 plus 1 so which is 12 by 7 so now what is the difference between the fifth and the sixth term So the difference is 12 by 7 minus 10 by 6 so which is equal to 72 minus 70 by 42 so which is equal to 2 by 42 so which is equal to 1 by 21 so th the difference between the fifth and the sixth term is 1 by 21 so is 3 by 4 a term in this sequence now we have to determine whether 3 by 4 is a term of the sequence so is 3 by 4 a term in this sequence okay to decide whether 3 by 4 is a term of this sequence so we will take this term equal to the nth term so if we take it equal to the nth term so 2n over n plus 1 is equal to 3 by 4 so we get this equation so now we will solve this equation for n so if the solution is a whole number then yes 3 by 4 will be a term of the sequence but if our solution is not a whole number then 3 by 4 won't be a term of the sequence now let us solve this equation for n so we can cross multiply here so 4 times 2 n is equal to 3 times n plus 1 so this is equal to 8 n which is equal to 3 n plus 3 so 8 n minus 3 n is equal to 3 so 5n is equal to 3 so n is equal to 3 by 5 3 by 5 since n is not a whole number so 3 by 4 will not be a term of the sequence so the answer will be no so 3 by 4 is not a term of the sequence